You're listening to the Fed and Fearless podcast. On today's episode, we're finishing with part two of the birth story of our daughter, Vera. So stay tuned. Welcome to the Fed and Fearless podcast. I'm your host, Laura Schoenfeld, a registered dietitian, nutrition business coach, and online entrepreneur with over 10 years of experience in online business. And I'm here to show you everything I've learned about creating a life and a business that nourishes you. On this podcast, we'll talk about the lifestyle habits, practical strategies, mindset shifts, and leaps of faith required to build a healthy body, a powerful mind, a strong spirit, and a successful business. Hey there, welcome back to the Fed and Fearless podcast. I'm Laura Schoenfeld, your host, and today's episode is part two of our two-part episode all about the birth of our daughter, Vera. Now, if you haven't had a chance to listen to part one, then I recommend you hit pause and go back and listen to part one before you start listening to part two, because we're going to just jump straight into things here, Um, and it would really be helpful to have some context to understand what you're listening to. Um, And just for more context, I actually brought my husband, Josh, to record his first ever podcast episode and our first ever joint episode together um, just because I wanted to have his perspective on the experience as well, especially because there was definitely times during the birth process where I didn't really know what was going on. And so he has a little bit of a different perspective to share with the actual events that happened. So I hope that you enjoy this conversation. And my goal is that if you're someone who's thinking about having a baby or maybe you're going to have another baby and you want to do it a little differently this time that you can learn from our experience because we were, you know, we'd prepped a lot. We had done a lot of learning, mostly me, but you know, my husband was learning stuff too. Um, And we did a lot of preparation for the birth experience in order to have a unmedicated physiological birth. And we were able to do that. It wasn't exactly what I expected, but It was something that um, I think went as well as it did because of the preparation that went into it. So my hope is that by us sharing the details of what we experienced and the lessons we learned and the mistakes that we made, that you too will be able to better prepare for your next birth or your first birth if you haven't had kids yet. Um, And also remember that you can do as much preparation as possible and you can't be fully prepared for what's going to happen. Birth is one of those things that... um, it's really a, an opportunity to learn how to let go, especially if you're type A control freak like I am. It was <laughs> definitely something that felt completely out of my control, which it was, um, but it was a really good opportunity to practice that combination of preparation and mindfulness and you know mental um, resilience while also letting go and trusting that Um, God was taking care of us during the whole experience. So I hope that you'll learn a lot from our conversation. Remember, this is part two. If you haven't heard part one back, um, if you haven't heard part one yet, go back and listen to part one. And then after you've listened to part one, we're just going to jump straight into our arrival at the hospital when I was very much dealing with contractions. So enjoy. So we got to the hospital and we had just gotten there late enough that the women's center was, like, the entrance was closed. Yeah, it was right around 8.30. No, it was, like, right before 8. They they closed a little early, I think, because they said that their entrance closed at 8. And yeah, yeah, I think yeah, we yeah. got there at, like, 7.55 or something. Yeah. Which is not a big deal. This is a small hospital, but it was just annoying because we literally had to, like, drive to the ER entrance. And then with the the other annoying thing is that the ER people that are admitting you into the hospital didn't know we were coming well they wouldn't have that that wasn't the issue the issue is that they're literally like afraid of women in labor like the labor and delivery nurses told us that the people that work in the er are like legitimately afraid of a woman in labor which to me makes no sense i feel like it would be much more scary to have somebody coming in with like a stab wound or something or a car accident than like in labor, which is not a medical emergency, but I'm not a nurse, so I don't know. Um, But I definitely remember, you know, we get there and the 
the guy that was doing the check-in was asking you all these questions. And one of the questions I remember hearing was, did her water break yet? And in my head, because it hadn't broken yet, I mean, maybe I was having a little bit of leaking fluid at that point, but I definitely didn't think my water had like broken. And in hindsight, it definitely hadn't because I, when it did break, it was very obvious. But um, when I heard him say that, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to punch this guy if he doesn't let us into this hospital just because my water hadn't broken yet. So I don't know why he was asking that. I mean, you would think yeah. any any reasonable person would have seen that, like, I was ready to get in there kind of thing. But I don't know. Maybe they get a lot of people that are, like, just way early and having that kind of reaction. Yeah. But, and at that point, I was at the mindset that we are going into this hospital right now. So I didn't. I wasn't totally honest with the guy. I'm like, yeah, yeah, she's leaking. Um, no, but that was that was true. I was. I think I did have a little bit of fluid leaking. Okay, but I didn't know that. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I was just like, I'm going to say what this guy wants to hear to get us through the door as quickly as we can. So, yeah. I mean, you could have just like, said yes, but um, yeah. but yeah, it hadn't. But I was like, get me in there. And so they brought a wheelchair out. And of course, every like two minutes, I have to stop the wheelchair and like push myself out of it because, you know, it's way more painful if I'm sitting on something because basically Vera's head was probably like pushing into my cervix against the seat of the car, of the wheelchair, and that was making it like way, way, way more painful. Um, And then so Josh had to go park the car and the nurses were bringing me in. And of course the ER nurses are like totally just clueless about what they should be doing. They're wheeling me towards the labor and delivery department. And every time I stopped or every time I had to stop for a contraction, I was like, somebody please squeeze my hips. Like I was like, crying, begging, like, just please do it. And they literally didn't know what I was talking about. And this woman, one of the nurses is like putting rubber gloves on. And I'm like, duh, you don't need rubber gloves. Just like put your hands here. Like I literally showed her, I was like, just put your hands here and just push. And then, so she's doing it and I'm like, please do it harder. Cause she like wasn't pushing that hard. And I was like, it was, uh, intense. So, and I think I was literally like traumatizing the nurses, but I don't care. Um, so they were definitely happy when I got there. Yeah, because they were like, I don't know <laughs> they what she like, wants. Please take over. Yeah. So anyway, at this point, they get us up to the labor and delivery department. Um, I guess the doctor who delivered Vera saw me. And we had had her as a doctor for – she was actually the one that did the version, ironically. So um, so she saw me, and she's like, oh, it looks like I'm going to be needed right now because she saw how uh, – how in distress I was. Um, Plus you were fully dilated. But she didn't know that just yeah, looking at me. Just looking at me in the wheelchair. Well, well not in the wheelchair. No, but I'm She came in and checked you out right away. Right. But I think she was on her way to a different room. And when she saw me, she told me this later, that when she saw me getting wheeled in, she was like, oh, I'm going there first. Like, she, you know, redirected her path to come to the room because she saw me. And then, um, so when we got into the room... They were, like, undressing me, and I was just like, oh, my God, just take it off. Like, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't care at all. I was like, I don't care who sees me right now. Just, like, get these clothes off. Um, and as I'm getting on to the bed in the delivery room, that's when my water broke. So um, it was like, I mean, people describe it as, like, a water balloon popping inside of you. That's literally what it felt like. And then the the water just went all over the bed. And I remember seeing the water and seeing that it had this like brownish tint to it. And because I had done a lot of research leading up to the birth, um, I knew that that was meconium. And meconium is the baby's first bowel movement or, you know, the first couple of bowel bowel movements where they're getting like whatever's in their intestines out before they've started feeding, like breastfeeding. And of course, what goes through my brain at that point is, oh my God, they're going to do a C-section. And I don't know why I thought that. I think I just at the time was like, you know, knew that the meconium in the fluid was something that is considered a a riskier situation. Um, And maybe there are some doctors that do that, but that was not the policy that my doctor (laughs) was under. Um, Basically what that meant at our hospitals that they just needed to have more nurses and staff in the room. They needed to have the pediatrician there so that they could like more closely monitor her because what can happen is that if she were to inhale that, um, because babies actually have amniotic fluid in their lungs when they're in the, in the womb and then during birth and everything, it's quite common for them to have it in their 
mouth and their lungs, that kind of thing. And so the fact that there was meconium in the fluid means that sometimes babies can um, aspirate that and then develop a lung infection. So, you know, and then they also don't know how long it's been in there. So there's a lot of stuff that can potentially happen. I don't know how, I don't know how common it is, but, you know, it adds a level of risk that if there hadn't been meconium in the fluid, wouldn't have been there. So of course I'm like extra freaked out because I was like, oh my God, they're going to like want me to do a C-section. And that was like the last thing I wanted. Um, but if, you know, it didn't, they didn't even talk about that. Basically the doctor was just like, there's poop in the pool. And I was like, ah, um, now she asked me if she could check my cervix. And at that point I was like, yeah, like I didn't want to have cervical checks before I was in labor. Um, cause they'll do that at your prenatal appointments. They'll be like, you want me to check your cervix? Like usually maybe a couple weeks leading up to your due date. I didn't want those because those can actually stimulate you to go into labor if they're not careful. Um, and the information you get, in my opinion, is not very helpful because you could be like not dilated at all. And then the next day be, you know, giving birth. So I didn't really want that information before, but when she asked to check now, I was like, yeah, I want to know like where, what's going on. And I just remember her looking and then hearing her say, well, she's complete. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm like fully dilated right now. And then she, the doctor was like, are you ready to push? And I was like, oh my gosh, we just got here. Like, okay, I'm ready to push. And honestly, like, I felt like my body was trying to push when I was getting onto the bed. I for, Do you remember, were they saying like, don't push yet, don't push yet. I remember her, somebody saying that. Uh, yeah, as you're, or prior to you actually getting on the bed, and yeah, they're telling you, like, yeah, don't push. I think it was when I was on the bed, and they were trying to get me. Oh, trying to get you in a position. Well, there was, so there was a bunch of stuff, like, they wanted to, well, they did try to put IVs in, which, in hindsight, I should have declined. Um, but they were trying to get me, like, situated for, you know, whatever they thought was the appropriate positioning. And, you know, after the water had broken and everything, um, I feel like now, like, again, these are fuzzy memories. Cause I honestly don't remember if this is a hundred percent accurate, but I feel like I remember feeling the urge to push right after my water broke, but they were like, don't push yet. Don't push yet. And I was like, okay, like I won't push yet, even though I wasn't purposely trying to push. Um, so then when she asked me if I was ready, I was like, yeah, I mean, I've already been like kind of pushing uncontrollably at this point. So yeah, I'm ready. Um, and this is where I, I, again, I feel like at the, I was in transition at this point. So if you've ever had a baby transition is basically that part of labor where you go from the contractions into the pushing. Usually it's the most intense as far as discomfort or pain is considered or concerned. And a lot of times like mentally, you're just like not able to really focus on what's going on outside of your body. Um, so these details on my end might be a little fuzzy. I don't know if Josh will remember everything, but um, so this is where another another thing that I learned a lesson during was the position I was pushing in because um, they wanted me to get on my back. The research I had done, the learning I had done suggested that pushing on your back was the worst position to push in for an easy and lower pain delivery, but I don't, I don't remember why, like, I, I guess I asked if I could push on my side instead, because I was already on my yeah. back for them to do the check of the cervix. And I was like, I don't want to push on my back. Can I push on my side? Because side lying pushing is technically better than um, pushing on your back. And they, they were like, okay, that's fine. So then they get me on my side and I like couldn't even keep my top leg up. And it was like, I didn't know if I could actually stay in that position. I don't know how long I was. I might have been in that position for just a few minutes. It was pretty quick, right? That was a fairly decent amount of time. And, and they were trying to figure out how to get a stirrup from the bed oh. in a proper situation to help support you. Uh, one of the nurses didn't really know how to operate the bed very well. Well, uh, I didn't know that because <laughs> I was not paying attention to that. <laughs> well, they couldn't get it into a place that worked. Uh, for you being on your side. Mm. Well, and then they were trying to get the IV in my arm. Did they even ask me? They must have asked for permission. I don't think they can just shove an IV in somebody if they don't. Well, it was more just, we need to put an IV. In. Oh, yeah. But it was like verbal. Like they said they were going to do it before they did it. And at that point, I didn't, I was like, whatever, just do whatever you need to do. 
Um, I'd had kind of some bad IV experiences with the the breech procedure where they had to poke a few times to get, I mean, really also the anesthesia had to poke a few times to get that right too. So I didn't really want an IV, but I was like, whatever, just do it. And that wasn't going well because I was like covered in sweat and like moving and stuff. So, um, so I, do you remember who suggested that I get on my back? Was it Dr. Tobin? Um, I think it was a combination of the nurses and the doctor because the side lying at that point, you seemed really uncomfortable in that position mm -hmm. and things weren't progressing the way they wanted. Um, so at that point they were making suggestions like, Hey, what do you think about trying on your back for a little bit? Yeah. So even though in my head I was like, I don't want to push on my back. I think I was so exhausted at that point. I was just like, okay, just I'll do whatever you tell me to do. If you can just make this stop. And I thought maybe I was like, maybe it's so close. She'll just come out and it'll be like super fast and everything. Um, so they laid me on my back and then they held my legs up. Like it was like two nurses per leg. I feel like, is that act? No, one nurse. It was just one. Yes. I just felt like there was a thousand people next to me, which <laughs> I was like not happy about, but they also had my they put my feet in stirrups, which was another thing I'd read. Don't do that. <laughs> so and it was on my birth plan to not use stirrups. So I don't know when the birth plan came out or if it came out at some point. It did. But it was early. And yeah, did we stick with it? No. Okay. Well, to be fair, I think writing it was more helpful than having it. Because we spent a lot of time preparing it so that by the time we got to that situation, we kind of knew what the goal was, but there was a lot of stuff that didn't happen exactly the way we had planned. Um, so they were having me push in a way that I learned not to push. So I did a course called Pain-Free Birth by, I think her name's Karen Welton. Um, she's Pain-Free Birth on Instagram. And she literally talked about the pushing method that most um, hospitals have you do and how it doesn't really work that well, or it's not you know, ideal. It's not like it doesn't work. Obviously people give birth like that all the time, but it's not ideal. And basically it's the one where you like hold your breath, push for like 10 seconds and then stop and then like recover and then do it again. Um, they tell you to like push out your butt, which that's another thing that I don't think was super helpful. I don't, and, and I do think a lot of these instructions were they might have been more appropriate for a woman who had an epidural. Because mm -hmm. when you have an epidural, you can't feel stuff. You can't do any position other than on your back or maybe on your side. Um, so they kind of have to, like, tell you these things to make it connect with your brain and body. I don't think pushing through my butt was what I ended up actually doing to push her out. I don't even feel like that's – it didn't even make sense to me. I was like, I don't know how to push through my butt. <laughs> so, like, I'm just going to push. And – I started getting really frustrated with the nurses. I mean, they were super nice, so this isn't to, like, disparage them. But, like, I remember one nurse, every time I would start pushing, she would be like, no, 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 not like that. And I wanted to slap her. I was like, do not tell me while I'm pushing, don't push like that, but then don't give me any, any instructions on what to do instead. It just was like, I don't know what you're – like you're telling me not to push like that, but you're telling me to push. And like, I don't know what else I'm supposed to do. So I think what I was doing was I was like pushing my, pushing with my legs. Um, which again, if you have an epidural, I don't think you can push with your legs. Cause I don't think you have like nerve control of your legs. So they probably weren't used to like holding a woman's legs. That's like pushing against them with her legs. But basically they were like trying to get me to stop pushing with my legs and really just push with my core, I guess. Um, but, like, they literally had my knees, like, almost up to my face, and I didn't feel like I could push without using my legs. So it was, it was like, really, like, I – that was one of the most, like, helpless, stressful, like – Frustrating. Yeah, just – I and, again, not blaming the medical team, just, like, in my head I was, like, I shouldn't be doing this, I shouldn't be doing this, and then I was, like, but I'm doing it anyway, and then they're telling me I'm doing it wrong, and it was just, like, this super – frustrating, like upsetting type of moment for me. Um, and I think I did that for about an hour. Is that right? 45 minutes to an hour, maybe? Probably, yeah, 45 minutes would be my guess. 
And I was like totally exhausted. Um, you know, I, the doctor said I was making progress. Like, I guess her head was like starting to poke out. Did, is yeah. that where you were? Yeah, she was crowning. Okay. So she was crowning at that point. <laughs> I'm like, again, I don't totally know everything that was happening because it's everything was kind of happening to me and I couldn't see what was happening. I literally had like a washcloth over my eyes because they had the spotlight on and that was blinding me. And I was like, I wanted it to be dark and like, you know. Yeah. But um, the doctor's like, well, we have to have at least some light so she could see. Yeah. Which, you know. In hindsight, I don't know if she needed to see because I don't really know. You know, if I had done what I wanted to do for the birth experience, I don't know if she would have needed to see anything. I think I would have been able to do it fine. But anyway, so I had this washcloth on my eyes so I couldn't see. And I was J- Josh was, like, using our stroller fan to keep me cool. Um, and I just got this, like, intuitive urge to be like, I need to get off my back and – with the education I had done with the birth um, prepping, I learned two different positioning um, strategies that I think were really helpful. One was called UFO, which stands for upright, forward, and open, I think. I think. Um, But basically, when the UFO thing is to get you leaning forward and using gravity, so your belly's kind of hanging, the gravity would be pulling the baby out of the birth canal as opposed to, like, trying to push the baby against gravity if you're on your back. Um, And so that was really, like, I was like, I need to get into a position where I'm working with gravity, not against it. And then the other one is called uh, Kiko. So it's K-I-C-O. Um, This one came from uh, someone named the Naked Doula on Instagram. And Kiko stands for knees in, calves out. So basically it's like your knees are as close together as you can and your calves or your ankles are as far apart as you can put them comfortably, which is like literally the exact opposite of how they had me. They had me with my knees out and I don't know where my ankles were, but, you know, my knees were totally out when they had me in that you know, on my back position. So it was the opposite of what I was supposed to be doing. And you can see when your knees are in, like you could do it right now. If you put your knees together, you can kind of feel your lower pelvis spread apart. And it's similar to what you, the benefit you get when somebody is applying pressure to the top of your hips, you get that opening at the base of the pelvis. And again, if you're trying to get a baby's head through your pelvis, you want that bottom part as open as possible. And so the knees in, calves out, or ankles out um, position helps open things up so that the baby's head can get through more easily. And I really think she probably could have been delivered a lot faster if I had gotten into that Kiko position because I think she was, like, kind of stuck at the base of my pelvis and her head. Because she was born with a bruise on the top of her head, and I think she was, like, hitting a bone in my pelvis and I think when I got into that other position, it opened it up so that her head could come out more easily. Not that it was easy, but it felt a lot easier than when I was on my back. So basically, I was like, can I please just get onto my hands and knees? And they were like, okay. Um, I always say to Josh, I'm like, I had to like demand that they let me get on my knees. And he's like, you kind of just asked them. And they said yes right away. They didn't like try to force you to stay on your back. But yeah, for there me, was, there was no argument. <laughs> but for me, it felt very much like, there was a lot of internal energy that had to be gathered and, and strength that had to be gathered to tell them I wanted to do something different and to, like, take charge in that situation. So I think that's what my experience was, is I was, like, gathering this, like, internal strength to be like, no, I'm not doing what you're telling me to do. I'm doing what I think I should do. So they basically propped up the back of the bed. I put my arms up on the back of the bed and leaned over and was on my knees and did the whole like knees and ankles out position. Um, so that my belly was hanging down. I was supported on my hands or my arms and on my knees. So I didn't have a lot of weight to carry necessarily. And I was like swaying and rocking back and forth and kind of like just moving my hips around in a way that felt like just natural. And I think that helped again, get her into a better position for actually coming out. Um, I was still in pain, so it didn't, like, fully eliminate the pain, but it was definitely way better than the pain that I was experiencing on my back trying to, like, push her out against gravity. Um, And, of course, this is, like, 
when I got on my hands and knees, this is when our doula arrived because I guess we waited way too long to tell her to come. I mean, I guess we you texted her when we were on our way to the hospital and she was like 45 minutes away yeah. to drive there. So it was our fault, but she like showed up as I'm on my hands and knees. Um, and I think that was when they had asked me if I wanted a mirror to see um, Vera's head. And I was like, I honestly don't think I can even look at something right now. Not not in like a disgusted way, but in like a, I don't have the energy to like think about anything else other than just like getting through this right now. But you looked, right, with the mirror? Yeah. Well, I had, when you were on your back, I looked when she was crowning. Oh, so you, you didn't look when I was on my knees? No. Oh, okay. I don't know. Again, I was very much in my own world at that point. Um, but anyway, so the funny thing was when I got on my hands and knees, everyone kind of backed off. Like, I don't really remember the nurses touching me at that point. Yeah, no, at that point, the nurses definitely just gave you space. Um, and I think a lot of it was because they didn't really know what to do at that point. Um, well, they or said how to assist because they didn't have a leg to hold. And it was just like one well, of them was making sure the washcloth stayed on your head. And that was about it. Apparently, the only person in the room, including the pediatrician that had ever seen somebody give birth on their knees like that was the doctor. Everybody else had only ever seen birth on a woman's back, which kind of tells you something. You know, that hospital had been open for like seven months at that point, and nobody had ever given birth other than on their back. Seems like hard to believe. But um, so they didn't. It also speaks to the percentage of women who have epidurals. Yeah, that's true. But still, I mean, it's like. Really, you hadn't seen one person deliver on their their knees before. So um, so anyway, I think it was like that was a position they weren't familiar with, so they didn't even know. I mean, they didn't know how to help. And honestly, I don't think there was anything any of them should have done. Like, I actually think being left alone was what I needed. Not like alone, like everyone leave the room, but just like don't touch me. Like let me do what I need to do. Um, and I feel like – that felt a lot better to me than having like multiple hands holding me and like, you know, the doctor is like massaging my perineum to try to like stretch things out a little bit. And that was uncomfortable. So it's just like, there was such a big difference between the pushing on my back versus the pushing on my knees. It was like night and day. Um, yeah, I would say at that point, I mean, from the time that you got on your knees to the time that Vera was born, you just seemed to kind of be in a zone all your own. And I, yeah, the, there was some communication between you and the doctor, but it was very minimal. Mm-hmm. And it was more just like words of encouraging, like, hey, yeah, that's that's working really well. And that's that's great. That's great. You're doing a good job. And I mean, from the time that you switched from your back to your knees, I mean, it was maybe 15 minutes until Vera was born. Yeah, maybe at that. I mean, I don't really have a concept of time when I was like in like the pushing stage, but um but I could feel that it was more productive. And her saying, like, oh, yeah, you're, you know, you're making progress. Like, that was helpful to tell me that, okay, you know, that's working. Keep doing that. Like, that's helpful to me versus somebody being like, no, don't do it like that. Like, that just wasn't helpful. Um, but at that point, I was like, I remember I was, like, head on the mattress that was propped up and, like, literally biting the mattress during the contractions to try. And I don't know if that was the best thing because the tension thing maybe wasn't helping. But I think at that point wasn't really, you know, using my, my hypnobirthing stuff. It was more just trying to get in the right position. Um, and I, you know, I felt like I was pushing on my own volition as opposed to being told when to push, which was a big difference. Um, at that point, I think they had messed up two IVs. So the first one that they had tried to place was like blowing up my arm and like totally making it huge and puffy. And so I think they like missed the vein or it rolled out or something like that. And then the other side started bleeding pretty substantially. Um, And I think, like, the needle had fallen out or something. So both IVs got screwed up. I was, you know, bleeding on one arm, like, just a hot mess, sweating. And at some point when I was pushing, I finally felt her head come out. And, like, you can tell the difference between when the head's in versus the head's out. And, of course, she started, like, scream crying, like, instantly, right? So the baby's head is, like, hanging out of me. She's crying really loud, apparently, because I don't know what a, you know, baby's supposed to sound like when they come out of the body. But apparently it was quite loud. 
because somebody was like, ooh, she's got some lungs on her or something. So, um, which is good because one of the reasons they had the pediatrician in the room was because, you know, babies that are born with meconium in the uh, fluid can sometimes come out not crying, like they need resuscitation. So the fact that Vera was crying instantly was a good thing. Um, so then I'm like, okay, like re- regaining my strength after that that big pushing experience to get her head out. And apparently, I, I couldn't see this, but apparently the doctor had like, turn to talk to somebody for a second. Yeah, she turns to talk to the pediatrician. And in that moment, another contraction came. Well, it was like a push. Like, basically, it was, there's something called the fetal ejection reflex, where your body literally pushes without you trying. It's kind of like, this is graphic, but it's kind of like when you have a poop that you didn't have to push out. It just came out on its own. But, like, times 10 as far as the intensity is concerned. So I wasn't pushing on purpose but like my body started to push and then I pushed with it. And that was when the rest of her body slid out. And because the doctor wasn't like expecting me to push her at that moment, Vera just like fell onto the table, which was fine. I mean, it was a bed. The bed, not the table. Well, it was kind of a table with like a mattress on it. Cause it's not, it wasn't really a bed. Nobody's like sleeping in that thing. It was more of like a delivery table bed kind of thing. Um, so anyway, she plops right out and like, that was why I was saying, I don't know how much help I really needed. Because if you think about the fact that, like, she didn't even get caught, like, technically, nobody really helped me finish delivering her. Um, but, you know, whatever it is, what it is. I had a huge sense of relief come over me because I was like, oh, my gosh, that's done. I see the baby on the bed. Um, I'm like, it's over. It's finished. Like, that was, you know. I just felt relief and exhaustion at that point. Um, they asked me if I wanted to hold her. They're like, oh, do you want us to pass her through your legs? You can hold her. And I was like, I need to lay down. If I try to hold a baby right now, I'm going to drop her. So I was like, can I just, like, get onto my back and then you can hand her to me? Um, so that's what I did. I laid down on my back. They helped me flip over. Um, I had to, like, maneuver around the umbilical cord because my placenta was still inside of me. But I got on my back, and then they put Vera on my chest. Um I was kind of just, like, shell-shocked at that point. I didn't really have any emotions. I know sometimes people are like, oh, I had this, like, huge hit of love that came over me when the, like, I just saw my baby and I was, like, the happiest I've ever been. I didn't feel that. I was just, like, happy it was over and, like, relieved that the baby was healthy, right? So, you know, if you are somebody who doesn't experience that, just know that that doesn't mean anything, doesn't mean anything about how you feel about your baby. It's, It's a very intense experience and it's okay if it's not, like, instant oh my gosh, now I'm in love kind of thing. So um, we did delayed cord clamping. So the cord turned white and then Josh cut it. Um, And then I remember hearing the doctor say something about Pitocin. And this was another thing that came up during my birth prep where I didn't want to have Pitocin to deliver the placenta. Um, Pitocin is basically... um, I don't know if it blocks oxytocin, but basically it eliminates the benefits that oxytocin gives you because it, it, I think it is a blocking mechanism. I don't know hundred percent, but basically they do Pitocin to help you deliver your placenta because it does technically reduce the risk of postpartum hemorrhage, which is one of the most common reasons why a woman would die after childbirth or during childbirth. Um, but oxytocin does the same thing. So as soon as I heard her talking about Pitocin, I was like, no, 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 I don't want Pitocin. Like, I just want expectant management of the placenta delivery, which is the the medical term. And the doctor was like, definitely kind of, she was like, oh, like, you know why we want to give you Pitocin, right? Like, she wasn't super happy that I didn't want it. Um, and I was like, yes, I understand. And if I need it, you can give it to me. If I'm If I'm hemorrhaging, yes, please give it to me. But can we just wait to see? So she was like, okay, that's fine. So um, I think I delivered the placenta maybe like 10 to 15 minutes later. Yeah, I think it was probably 10. Yeah, it wasn't a ton of time. And we – It didn't take long at all. Yeah. And it wasn't hard either. Like there was no – I don't even hardly remember it. Like I just feel like it was like – Oh, there it is. Like blah. Like it just came out. Um, (laughs) And we did placenta encapsulation. So they took it and put in the the cooler and everything. So – um, now I don't know when this happened. I did have second degree tearing. I'm pretty sure it happened when I was pushing on my back. Um, but you know, 
who knows when it actually happened. Um, but the doctor had to stitch that. So I was like laying there with the baby while she did that. They use like local anesthesia to just like numb the area and then stitch it up. Um, the pediatrician checked her to make sure she was healthy because of the meconium situation and like everything was good. Baby was healthy. I was fine. I wasn't bleeding um, excessively. I mean, yes, you bleed a lot after giving birth, but there's like a certain amount they consider to be like healthy and normal versus dangerous. So my bleeding was normal. Um, and so then they were like, okay, it's time to get you to the maternity ward. So I guess they have like a different room that you go in once the baby's born and it's more of like the recovery room. Um, and I remember like Dr. Tobin, like gave me a fist bump while they were wheeling me past her to get there and everything. So, um, so yeah, that was it. I mean, I was in a lot of pain, like the first couple weeks after giving birth or even the first couple days, it was very painful. I actually had to get a catheter to, catheter to help me pee because I think Fear's head was like hitting my urethra and like making it swollen so I couldn't pee. Um, so like my pelvic floor was like non-functional. I was in a lot of pain. Um, you know, breastfeeding was brand new. So that was kind of painful. They were waking me up every, what, like two hours or something to feed her overnight. So it was like quite an intense after birth experience too. Um, but looking back on it, I was really happy that I got what I wanted. I got a physiological unmedicated birth. Um, I think, you know, maybe 14 to 16 hours total of labor from the start to, you know, Vera being here. Um, she's a super healthy baby. She's doing great. She's, I think, what, almost 11 weeks now at the time of this recording. And um, I feel very strongly that avoiding the medication is something that helped me bond better with her, helped me get breastfeeding established. And overall, I just, I'm really glad I did it. And I know people say like, you don't get a medal for doing an unmedicated birth, but um, obviously I don't have any, any way to know this for sure. But I do think that doing it unmedicated helped me have a baby that was calmer and, um, you know, just was like a more calm postpartum experience than if I had been under a lot of medications or ended up getting a C-section or something like that. So I'll never know, but I think it was worth it to learn how to do the unmedicated birth and to stick to my guns when it got like really hard. I think I was at the point at the hospital that they, it would have been too late for an epidural anyway. So I was probably going to end up doing it without pain meds anyway. Um, they didn't have nitrous oxide at that hospital. So, you know, that wasn't available to me. So it was very much a mental mind over matter experience. And I think overall the experience taught us a lot about communicating. Um, postpartum has been a lot of learning about how we communicate and learning to communicate better as a couple. Um, I think for me, I also realized like there's a, there's a balance in my life that I need to learn how to hit between knowing what's right and doing what I think is right and following my intuition and also letting people help me. So that was something that, um, you know, if I was going to take a lesson away from the birth, it would be trust my instincts and also don't be so afraid to ask for not just help, but like ask for what I need, um, from people. Because I think sometimes I'm like, oh, I can do it myself. I'm fine. Like, you know, Josh going to the softball game was very much like I can handle it myself. And in hindsight, I couldn't handle it myself and I shouldn't have handled it myself. And, um, you know, that's a situation where I should have listened to my gut, which my gut instinct was, I don't want him to leave. Um, but just understanding that, like, I need to ask for help sometimes and I can receive help and that's going to help me have the best experience possible with any sort of challenging situation versus trying to do it all myself, but then also like ignoring my intuition about stuff if somebody's trying to help me. So that was kind of a <laughs> nutshell version of the lesson I learned. I don't know if you have a lesson that you feel like you learned through the experience. I mean, definitely a lot of things that I'll be more mindful of and aware of. Um, and I mean, second time around, definitely be a little more prepared, obviously. Uh, and just knowing what's coming and what to expect is going to be such a game changer. Um, 
And I think for any dad in a situation where you have no idea what's going on or what you can be doing, um, yeah, just staying proactive, asking questions. And yeah, if, if your partner isn't being super communicative or isn't necessarily letting you know what they need, yeah, just ask more questions. Um, same thing when you're at the hospital, don't be afraid to talk to the doctors and the nurses, ask questions and figure out uh, from them like what you can be doing or where you can uh, be more active. Um, and don't just let them say that you're doing a good job, even if you're, you feel like you're doing nothing, uh, because they will do that. A lot of them will, um, they're like, oh, you're doing great. Um, and they'll just tell you to go stand in a corner. <laughs> so what? don't, don't take that for the, uh, the thing to do. Um, cause sometimes the, the nurses, doctors, they just want you out of the way. Um, but yeah, don't, don't allow that to be the scenario. Um, take an active interest in what's happening and yeah, ask questions and do whatever you can to just stay involved. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that they were telling you you were doing a good no, job. No, they didn't. Oh yeah. They, yeah, they were constantly telling me that I was doing a good job. Were you and, like, what am I even doing? Uh, at times I'm like, what did I do a good job? At? <laughs> it's like the opposite <laughs> problem when I was like, when she was telling me that I didn't or not to push the way I was pushing, like, I was like, well, then how do I push if I'm not supposed to be doing that? I had to figure it out kind of thing. And then and so for you, it was like they were telling you you were doing a good job and you were like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Well, yeah. And part of it was um, just the fact that I knew where things were. And like anytime that they asked for something, like when they asked for the birth plan, I knew where it was and <laughs> had it to them in like 30 seconds. I feel like it sounds like they have so. a pretty low bar for the dads. <laughs> Sadly, which is, I'm guessing, not unusual for the man to have no idea what's going on. So just the fact that you had some idea of what was going yeah. on was like, yay, give him a gold medal. So, yeah, so if, you, if you've got that bag of things that you're taking with you to the hospital, know what's in there. Know what the things that are in there are for. Um, it's going to be a huge help. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the more you understand, the more you know about what's in your bag of tricks or in your bag of tools, I should say, uh, the better off you're going to be. Well, and I think if we have another child, you might um, spend some time learning. Vera's like, this episode needs to be over. Um, <laughs> he might spend a little bit more time learning some techniques, comfort techniques, or just ways that he can support me that, like, he can know to do versus having to ask me what I want. Because I think, you know, when you're in that situation and, like, you're just delirious and somebody says, what do you want? It's like, you don't even know what you want versus if he was like, do you want me to do this? Like, do you want me to, you know, put a cold washcloth on you? Do you want me to blow a fan on you? Like asking if I want something, I might be like, yeah, let's try that. Right. So like, if you have a partner that's involved in the process, getting them prepared so that they can actually offer things. And of course, I think having the doula there longer would have been super helpful. It wasn't her fault. She got there so late, but like, yeah. The intention of hiring the doula was to help give Josh suggestions on how to comfort me or for her to do some comfort stuff herself. So because she wasn't there, Josh didn't really have anyone coaching him. Um, so, you know, next time we'll call the doula way earlier and we'll also make sure Josh has some ideas about what he can do to help rather than just feeling helpless or feeling like he needs to wait for me to tell him what to do. Because not only did I not really know what he, I wanted him to do, but, like, we realized not only during birth but also in the postpartum period that, like, I don't feel supported if I have to tell him to do something. I mean, I feel more supported than if I asked you to do something and you didn't do it. But, like, I need somebody to do stuff without me asking is what I realized. And so, you know, it's hard to expect that from somebody if they – don't have any knowledge to pull from. And so I think if we have another child, we'll probably plan for you to have some knowledge to pull from and for the doula to be there longer ahead of time so that I can just like be in my body and like you can make suggestions, but not need me to tell you what I need. Cause I didn't even know what I needed at that point. Does that sound accurate? Well, and just having it be the second time is <laughs> that, that will, a big difference. That'll help. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Anything else you want to share? Um, no, I mean, even with all of the ups and downs of the experience and knowing there's definitely things that we're going to want to do differently. Um, I, it's the best ending uh, we could have hoped for. Uh, we have a beautiful little girl named Vera and we can't be happier. Yes. Well, I know that was a lot and hopefully that was either helpful or entertaining or edutaining, which is educational and entertaining at the same time. Um, you guys got to meet Josh. So, you know, that's cool since obviously he's a huge part of my life and he's technically a, a team member as well. Um, if you guys have any questions about our experience or even like the postpartum period, we might come and do an episode about, you know, parenthood and what having a new baby's like, and especially in the context of being a self-employed entrepreneur with the woman being the one that is the revenue generator. Um, you know, I, I think there's a lot of need for those conversations that isn't really happening. And I know I don't know a lot of people that are talking about it. So I'm, you guys know me, I'm an open book, happy to share with you guys. So feel free to DM me on Instagram. Let me know if there's anything you want me to talk about or want us to talk about on another episode. Um, because, you know, we're learning as we go. And I think you can learn from mistakes. You can learn from other people's mistakes. You can learn from education ahead of time. And, um, you know, my goal is always to learn as much as possible and then do the thing and then learn through doing it as well. So it's how I got to where I am in business. And I applied the same strategy to motherhood. And I think it's worked pretty well. So, I mean, there's definitely a lot of challenges, but I think it could have been a lot harder had I not prepared. Um, so don't let anyone tell you that there's no point of preparing because I think there's a lot of point to preparing. Just also be ready to release control of the situation because you can't fully control it w even with all the preparation. So it's that balance of prepare, but then, you know, be ready for things to go differently than what you expected. Um, but anyway, thanks for hanging out with us for this episode. Uh, it's really great to be back with you guys, and I can't wait to continue sharing more about our journey as entrepreneur parents. And we'll look forward to seeing you here next week on the Fed and Fearless podcast. Take care, everybody. Are you a dietitian or nutritionist business owner that wants to create an online business that consistently brings in dream clients who actually want to buy your services, but you're struggling to figure out the right business strategy to get there? Then keep listening because I have a special opportunity that will help you create the highly profitable and impactful nutrition business that you always wanted. Inside my signature group coaching program, the Nutrition Business Accelerator, created exclusively for nutrition and dietitian entrepreneurs, you'll learn how to start, grow, and scale your online business to six figures and beyond so you can experience the financial and time freedom that you desire. I created this program to help struggling nutrition entrepreneurs get clarity on who they serve, how they serve them, and how they can stand out in a crowded market so that they can more easily attract dream high paying clients into their online nutrition business. This program is for brand new business owners and nutrition students, as well as those who have been in business for months or maybe even years, but aren't getting the traction that they'd like to see in their growth. Inside the NBA, you'll learn the most important foundational business building and marketing principles, not just the latest tools like social media, so that way you can experience sustainable business growth that adapts to the constantly changing world of online business. Over the course of 12 weeks, I'll show you how to attract high paying clients who are excited to work with you and willing to pay you the rates that you deserve. You'll get training on how to effectively sell your services in a way that feels authentic and converts prospects into paying clients without feeling pushy or salesy. And you'll get step-by-step -step instructions on how to create programs and services that provide truly transformative results, leading to glowing testimonials and referrals from your current clients, so you can have the greater impact that you desire in the world around you. You'll also learn how to manage your time, your energy, and your resources, so you can get more done in less time and experience the freedom that you really got into entrepreneurship for. When you apply what you learn in the NBA program, 
You'll never have to feel stuck or overwhelmed in your business again. Want to make this your reality? Then the Nutrition Business Accelerator is your pathway to achieve all of this and more. Get the proven strategy that has helped hundreds of business owners start, grow, and scale their nutrition businesses to five to $10,000 months and beyond and accelerate your progress to build the nutrition business of your dreams. Go to lauraschoenfeld.com forward slash NBA to learn more about the program and get your name on the wait list so that you can be the first to know when our doors are open for our next round. That's lauraschoenfeld.com slash NBA, which is short for Nutrition Business Accelerator. If you have big dreams of running your own profitable and joy-filled nutrition business, you do not want to miss out on this one-of-a-kind business coaching opportunity. I can't wait to support you inside the NBA program.